In this segment, we'll cover pointers on the planning, implementation, and delivery of slideshows. These are generic principles that apply to the use of any Slideware application, be it Microsoft PowerPoint, Apple Keynote, or OpenOffice Impress. I'll also be presenting my graphics using the form factor of a PowerPoint slide to model the ideas in a realistic context. Planning a slideshow is a lot like writing a research paper. First, you need to determine your topic, then come up with a succinct title that summarizes the idea in the fewest words possible. Titling a presentation is a lot like titling a Hollywood movie. Your audience can discern what it's about much as they do when opting to buy tickets to a comedy, horror story, or action film. Like a report, you should also provide your name in the byline. Tufty recommends that you include at least one means of address on the title slide, such as your email, so participants can get in touch with you afterwards. Once you've fixated upon a title, you can begin outlining your presentation, much as you'd draw up an outline for a report. You should start with a simple list of topics. Note that each topic will correspond to the headings on your slides. Any items subordinate to a topic will also correspond to list items in corresponding slides. Most Slideware applications allow you to toggle between thumbnails and outline view, as in the PowerPoint exemplar shown here. In fact, many people prefer combining the planning and generation of their slides using outline view. If you've done your planning in outline view, you can cut right to the chase in crafting your deck. In PowerPoint, the resulting slides are generated concurrently in the construction window. It's important to go back and reverse engineer your outline, however, in order to add one crucial slide right after the title slide. This is called the advanced organizer slide. Like the table of contents in a research paper, the advanced organizer slide previews the major talking points of your presentation. It's cognitively effective because the audience can begin creating mental placeholders for the information you're about to deliver. This is analogous to what we're taught in pedagogy courses. Summarize what you're going to tell them, tell them, then tell them again for closure. Tufty makes a number of font formatting recommendations. The first is to use a standard sans serif font throughout, such as Arial, Tahoma, or Verdana. These render more clearly on modern displays. Second, no font should be less than 18 to 24 points in size. That sounds huge, but not when you're the poor soul viewing a presentation from the back of the room. Another recommendation is to use mixed case fonts. Never use strictly all uppercase or all lowercase characters. The combination of ascenders and descenders enhances the readability and cognitively encodes better. Italics and underscores have also been found to detract from readability. Let me add parenthetically that mixed fonts, such as you'd find on a ransom note, have been found to detract from readability. It may look artsy, but it's not cognitively effective. Tufty also recommends keeping the amount of text to a minimum. The fewer words written, and spoken for that matter, the lower the cognitive load. To improve navigation, number all slides except the title slide. It's also better to use number lists and not bullet lists. Students can then reference talking points by slide and item number, such as, can you go back to slide three, item four? According to the six by six rule, no slide should contain more than six items across or down. Six or seven list items is around the maximum people can mentally process at any given time. Next, let's broaden our vision to the two types of content embedded in slides. Words and graphics are examples of static content. Animations, videos, sound clips, and clickable hyperlinks are examples of dynamic content. Use dynamic content whenever possible to enliven your delivery. Keep in mind, however, the law of inverse distance, which states that display resolution should be inversely proportional to audience distance. You can use a lot of text if your viewers will be experiencing your presentation nose against screen on their laptops. If you're projecting in a large auditorium, however, most viewers may be far away. So you should rely more on graphics to get your message across. 
In the next installment, we'll present Monkey See, Monkey Do on-screen tutorials on the button-pushing aspects of generating slideshows using PowerPoint.